Hello and welcome to Labor Lens. I am Sharon Ijasson. On this week edition of the program, we'll be discussing about the several grievances that a non-academic staff union of universities is having with the payment platform of the federal government called IPIS. For them, if the federal government refused to attend to the several grievances they have with the payment platform called the Integrated Payroll and Personnel Information System, they would definitely have to go on an industrial action. Academic Staff Union of Educational and Associated Institutions, NASU, has given the federal government an ultimatum to address the issue of anomalies in the research institutes and integrated payroll and personnel information system IPES. The IRS has demonstrated high level of incompetence and inefficiency. Our experience since we migrated to the platform has been a painful one, and all our efforts to get government and the Office of the Accountant General of the Federation to redress the noticeable shortcomings have not yielded positive results. Some of the noticeable the shortcomings include non-payment of salary to some staff, un underpayment of salaries, non-payment of approved allowances as contained in the year 2009 FGN NASU agreement, failure to pay check-off dues to the union, branch, and national headquarters as and when due, non-payment of promotion areas, non-deduction of welfare scheme, high taxation, non-release of pay slips to workers, delay in payment of salaries, non-release of schedule of payments made, and others. Unfortunately, all that we have done, including a 14-day warning strike and a memorandum of understanding MOU signed with government on October 2020, where the director of IPs was directed to ensure that all these, all these anomalies are corrected within two weeks. And a special committee headed by the chairman of the National Salaries, Income and Wages Commission was set up to deal with the issues of unpaid allowances to our members have failed to yield the desired result. At the National Executive Council meeting, it was noted that for almost 10 years, the federal government has failed to honor the content of agreement it freely entered into with the joint research and allied institutions sector. ASU and the three unions in the university need to work together if the struggle to fund education is to be realized. ASU alone, NASU alone will not be able to achieve this. We have allowed the whole thing to have gone this far. I believe we need to look at sources that will complement public funding of education at all levels because it appears that even if we devote the whole budget of this nation to education, we will go nowhere. Members of the union want all state and local governments to implement the approved national minimum wage, including the consequential adjustments. As the non-teaching staff. The IPPIs has not been favorably, most especially to non-academic staffs. We on research, we have been in IPPIs for almost six years. But uh, very recently, the university structures, they migrated into the IPPIS and a series of uh, anomalies has been observed in which uh, the unions have embarked on seven days, one strike, but yet up to now, nothing has been done. Some staff salaries were not paid, some staff salaries were short paid. Even the union check-up deals, they remove it directly from the source and yet nothing has been done. They refuse to remit back. The dues, even so many like the, the even the cooperative monies, and there are some social welfare schemes that has been observed in some universities is being removed by the IPPIS, and yet they refuse to disburse the money to the proper quarters. Well, uh, we've adopted it. 
we've moved into it, but unfortunately, what we are experiencing in it is very disheartening. In terms of short pay, in terms of uh, <coughs> on their payments of the staff salaries and allowances, in terms of uh, non-payment of uh, third parties, union check of dues, non-release of union check of dues, as well as uh, cooperative uh, dues and other, other third parties. So it's very unfortunate that what the government promised and the officials of IPPIS promised in the initial stage well, isn't what is happening now. So that is the position now. We hope the government will act quickly to affect the upcoming industrial crisis. Generally, it's an issue that cut across all other trade groups. And as a NEC and FNGPC member, I think I can still lend my voice on some of the issues that came up. Um, initially, NASU as a union keyed into the IPPIS platform, thinking that the government would be sincere enough to play their part. But unfortunately, we discovered that there are a lot of an um, um, anomalies um, that come up uh, from the IPPIS platform, such as the non-remittance of um, deduction, short payment, and what have you. And um, ever since then, uh, the union leadership has been doing what is expected of them to ensure that the government rights the wrong. And um, we are still exploring every other avenues we think we know we can use to get the government to do the needful. Well-articulated issues that um, range from tax matters and some other deductions that are not actually supposed to be, which has uh, whittled down whatever impact um, the new minimum wage has um, um, to offer anybody. They have to stop those deductions. Look at issues like the peculiarities of the university system, which includes the earned allowances and all other allowances and other issues, they have to take care of those. And then, if government is not willing and is not ready to do that, we have our own platform which we have developed in conjunction with SANU, that is NASU and SANU. Let government come and take it. Even though we've submitted, let them go ahead with all the tests. We assure government that our platform will take care of the corruption issue they are talking about and at the same time take care of all the staff in the universities. Well, if they want to extend it to other federal tertiary institutions, well and good. In the segments this week, I will be speaking with the General Secretary of the Non-Academic Staff Union of Universities, Comrade Peters Adeyemi. He also doubles up as the Vice President Global of Public Service International. He spoke about the several challenges members of his union are faced with and spoke on the possibility of an industrial unrest if the government refused to yield to their demands. It's good to have you on the program. Thank you. A lot has happened since our last conversation, which should be up to a year now. Um, what would be your reaction towards the payment platform of the federal government, which is um, the Integrated Payroll and Personal Information System, IPIS? How have your members been reacting to this payment platform? Yeah, it's simply horrible. It's, uh, it's one of the biggest disasters that has ever happened. Um, the IPPIS itself probably could have been uh, one of the policies that government conceived for the purpose of uh, fishing out good workers and possibly saving money for government. It, it could also be referred to as uh, one way by which you fight corruption. But we find out from our experience in NASU that our good intention in asking our members to key into the IPPIS has uh, been a very horrible experience because of the level of uh, ineffectiveness and inefficiency displayed by the IPPIS. It's very unfortunate that we find that they were ill-prepared. Ill 
they were clearly not ready. And uh, from our experience, even when we visited their offices, we found that they were also not adequately staffed. So if you have been operating haphazardly, IPPIS has been operating haphazardly with the ministries and uh, a few of the parastatters. We thought that it would have made a lot of sense for them when in an attempt to, you know, bring on board uh, the critical sectors of the tertiary institutions, that is federal polytechnics, federal colleges of education, federal university and inter-university centers. We thought that they would have increased their manpower, they would have uh, gone for enhanced training, and then there would have been sufficient personnel and uh, space uh, for that. But we find out that uh, all of that has not been uh, something that we have seen very clearly. And uh, when we started in February, uh, we find that there was massive uh, crisis associated with uh, the implementation in February. Some were paid salary, some were not paid at all. Some were underpaid. Uh, deductions were not made. Uh, allowances that our members have been collecting for years as a result of our collective bargaining agreement with the federal government were completely excluded. Um, no, dues were not deducted. Wel welfare, virtually all our, all our branches and members were running welfare scheme. They shut those ones down. They won't, you will not see pay slip. Promotions were not reflected. And uh, a whole lot of things. And we, we, we were forced to convey meetings of our members because our members were very bitter. They were very unhappy that we proceeded in uh, enrolling them on that uh, platform when at least one union in the, the university and inter-university centers had passed a vote of no confidence on IPPIS. And we thought that, uh, honestly, that if government is uh, sincerely fighting corruption, then as responsible Nigerians, if our key into the IPs, we also strengthen the work of government in fighting corruption in the system, that we should do so. And so we went in with uh, the intention of showing to the world that we are also good citizens who want to partner with government in achieving its laudable uh, uh, objective of uh, fighting corruption. We ended up finding that some of the celebrations that are taking place about government saving money from the IPPIS uh, platform was clearly a, a mirage. It was, it was something that was uh, non-existent. What government was celebrating is they were, they were using the platform to shortchange the workers, to prevent us from collecting our members from collecting the, the thing that, the, all the allowances that they are entitled to. And then when you make, and when you make that savings, you, then you say you have saved some money. That, that, that is illegitimate savings because there is no reason why our members should be paid less than what they were collecting before we migrated to the IPs. Because the, the platform we were using before was also a, a, a government platform, gift me. So it's really strange. If you can't add to my money, why do you reduce it? As we speak, some people, some workers have not collected salaries for about eight months. And we keep repeatedly reminding them. And they, they just turn their deaf ear into, into all our complaints. So clearly, it was one of the most uh, harrowing and very negative experiences that we have contended with. And clearly, we are also not going to fold our arms. As Nigerian citizens, you can't deny us our right, and you go to bed. We, all the people that are doing this to our members, we wake, up, we wake them up from their sleep. We will use all legitimate means, including strike, to get our rights restored. Talking about um, allowances, one of the um, challenges that um, the non-academic staff union have been faced with is the payment of earned allowances. Can you bring us up to speed on how the, pay how the payment platform would have affected the payment of earned allowances? Now you also know that uh, for over a period of time we have been uh, putting pressure on government for the payment of the earned allowances to our members and uh, government has responded over about three or four times now with uh, releases. So, but government had actually fallen in areas of payment of these end allowances. And government has also refused to hake into our call that rather than owing this money, why don't you factor 
the, the cost implication into your annual budget and you pay as you pay salary so that you, you have, you know, avoid this situation of uh, accumulating areas. Up to now, they have not done so, even though we now heard that they want to do so. Of course, several government will tell you they are going to do something when there is a strike and the moment the strike is off, they, all of them go to bed. So in the, the recent push by uh, the unions, all the unions, in the university and the university center, government is now saying they have put in, uh, they are allocating about 40 billion. Of course, it's always very contentious when this uh, allocation is going to be made. Government will negotiate with that other union, which you know very well, and then when they want to share the money, the other union will say they, they own the biggest chunk of the money, and then they give the non-teaching staff peanut. But what we are saying this time around, and we're, we're saying it seriously, we are not opposed to the other union that has struggled and have worked very hard to earn what is due to them. But what we are saying is that the non-teaching staff should also be paid what is due to them. In fact, you know the arrears is not something that is open-ended because the, every staff has what is due to he or she as arrears over a period of years. And from these releases, our expectation is that from these releases, and from the payments that have been made so far, each staff will, should know what he or she has earned and what is the balance. So from the next release, it should be possible for every staff to be paid what is the balance due to, to, to the staff. It cannot be just that one union will want to take advantage of taking the whole money. Because clearly every staff of the university, as far as this end allowance is concerned, has what has been programmed as what is due to he or she. So as we go ahead, we are watching the, the drama as they unfold, but clearly we are not going to accept a situation where they will give us a peanut and then cede the, the bigger chunk of the money to the other union. It's, it's a very contentious issue, which I think can also lead to the breakdown of industrial peace and tranquility in the system. The Kogi state government and the Boeing state government have prescribed unions in the universities as um, the vice president of um, PSI. How would you respond to this? No, it's, you know, clearly uh, the Kogi owner has been on for a while and the matter is in court. Uh, we took them to we took the Kogi state governor and the government to court. Uh, so I probably wouldn't want to comment on that so that because it's uh, going to be subjudice. Uh, but the one in uh, Bonyi is also coming to us as a surprise uh, because we know clearly that uh, the trade union uh, issue is not within the purview of state government. It's clearly on the exclusive list. So we, we have uh, brought this to the attention of His Excellency, the Governor of uh, Bonyi State, uh, His Excellency David Umayi, Engineer David Umayi, and uh, he has uh, talked to us one-on-one -on -one, that uh, he will be meeting with us very shortly so that we can uh, redress it, the situation. So we are hopeful that uh, that order in uh, Ebony State will be vacated very soon after our meeting with the governor. But if he doesn't, then we will know the next step to take. Talking about the national minimum wage, uh, many state governments are yet to implement the consequential adjustment uh, which um, arised um, from the increase in the new national minimum wage approved by President Momo de Buari. And there are some other state governments that, have, that are yet to even pay the arrears for those that have implemented. Um, how would you react to this? It's a very complicated matter. You are aware that even while we were negotiating the national minimum wage, under the chairmanship of uh, Amma Pepu, uh, quite a lot of the, the, the governor's forum were not favorably disposed. They were clearly opposed, but we pushed ahead and we got the 30,000 Naira minimum wage. And you also know that the 30,000 is uh, just the minimum. Uh, and that was why you had to, you find a situation where for a very long time we had disagreement on the consequential adjustment in. Uh, which of course took a lot of time. But the truth of the matter is that as we speak right now, just about half of the states have even implemented the minimum wage. Some of them implemented the minimum wage without doing anything about the consequential adjustment. In some states, what they did was they just offered a flat rate 
some 7,000, some 10,000 across the board. Uh, so clearly that is in breach of the spirit of the agreement. But don't also forget that uh, when labor is supposed to be pursuing this issue vigorously, the COVID-19 pandemic set in and uh, businesses were shut down, including uh, even government activities. I'm sure that has also hampered uh, uh, the ability of labor to vigorously pursue this. Even after the COVID-19 crisis, you also have a situation where we were contending with the NSAS uh, uh, revolution. But I think that uh, we need to do more uh, now that we are, are clearly getting out of the COVID-19 thing. I'm not, I'm not talking about the fact that there has been a, a alarm raised about the second uh, coming of COVID-19. But I think that uh, our states, the states, chapters of uh, NLC, TUC, and even the joint negotiating councils in the state will have to put more pressures on the various state governments that have uh, not uh, been able to pay. Ah, don't also lose fact of uh, lose uh, fact of uh, the, don't lose uh, sight of the fact that uh, some of the state governments are also complaining that what they are getting from the federal allocation account has also gone down drastically. And that's why we insist from the side of labor that government and governors are not expected to be over completely dependent on what they get from the money that is being shared monthly uh, at the level of the federal. We think that every state government should be innovative, should, should, should do more in terms of generating uh, revenue internally. And quite a lot of them have, have done well in that regard. So I think that if there is the will, there must always be a way. Unemployment, underemployment seem to be a big issue in the country. As an experienced labor leader, what would be your advice to ensure that decent work is being achieved in the country? Yes, I think governments should consciously look into all the reports that have been uh, submitted to government about uh, generating employment for the youth. Uh, in fact, the time is now. Uh, we, must, we are not so, supposed to be talking about employment alone. We must be talking of uh, uh, employment that is sustainable. Uh, because quite a number of state governments have, uh, have gone into different type of programs for which they say is for the generation of employment. But if you look at what they pay, it's clearly nothing to write home about. You know, you put up a program, and you pay graduates 10,000, you pay them 15,000, you pay them 20,000. That will not, that is clearly unemployment. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, not something that is sustaining. And uh, this present situation in our country today of uh, youth unemployment is clearly an indication. There is, there is clear indication that uh, we are sitting on a keg of uh, gunpowder that can explode any time. If you have millions and millions of, the, of uh, uh, those who go to school, tertiary institutions, and come out and have nothing to do. Uh, they said that, it is said that uh, an idle hand is the devil's workshop. So I think it's important, apart from looking at the records and looking at all those reports of various conferences and uh, talk shops that are taking place as to how employment can be generated, I think there is also need to, to conv convocate a stakeholders forum where people of like minds can talk about an enduring policy for employment generation in our country. The situation is so bad now that if we don't do something very fast, we are going to end up in a big crisis. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me. And that's all we can take on today's edition of the program. Join us next week for a fresh edition of the show. I am Sharon Ijasson. Thanks for watching and remember that labor creates wealth.